Okay, so if you have your Bibles there, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. Not a very long chapter today, but it's, uh, it's packed full of some very important uh, information here for us as a church. And so if you'll remember last uh, time we were meeting in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, um, we talked a little bit about um, the, the ministry of the apostles and even just a bit of a reminder that, the, that he, as, as Paul was looking at the Corinthian church, he, he wanted them to be respectful of his ministry and, and, uh, and to, uh, he didn't want to have to come and admonish them. Um, but at the end, he says, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And so um, in this next chapter, you'll see why he felt a need to be quite confrontational with the Corinthian church. And, and so let's look at verse 1 there. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this thing be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So if we go back to verse 1, um, you can kind of see um, sometimes we refer to the Corinthian church as a carnal church, and maybe it was to some degree, but maybe it was also not that different than the churches of our day today. Um, but in this particular instance, Paul was really surprised at their position as a church. Because um, so, he, he makes this comment here, this statement, he says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, the kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. So he was, he was giving, and I think he was, he was shaming the Corinthian churches, uh, or, or particularly the, this church here, the Corinthian church. He was shaming them by giving them an understanding that, that even the pagan people that were surrounding the church had a law that would not allow them to do what this man was doing this man had, had his father's wife. It likely, it, the, the likely scenario here is that, that he was maybe living in an immoral relationship with his stepmother. Um, that's, that's likely what, what most biblical historians believe about this passage. And, and I believe that makes the most sense there as well. It doesn't say that a man was involved with his mother or anything like that. It says he was involved with his father's wife. But the, the, the Gentile people, they even had laws in their society that, that this was not even allowed um, for them. It was not permitted for them. And, and so Paul shames the church here and he says, you are doing something that even an unbelieving world wouldn't do. You're, you're, sexual, you're having the sexually immoral lifestyle in your church and not only that, he says, you're arrogant about it. You're, 
in, in the sense maybe is that, that, that maybe, they, maybe they thought, well, grace covers all our sin or something like that. And, and, and today we can identify with that a little bit because we live in a world where, where there are many people that, that might say, well, you know, we have all kinds of people that come into our building, you know, and, uh, but that's okay. Grace covers everything that they do. And in, in, in this particular instance here, um, Paul says, hey, this is, this is bad. You know, you know, the unbelieving world around you is now aware of what you're doing in the church. This isn't something that's secret. This is, this is open sin. And, and you're arrogant about it? Like, he says, ought you not rather to mourn? And, and the, the, the picture here of mourning is that of like putting on sackcloth and mourning for the dead. If you actually look at the, the original language here, it, it's actually the kind of language that would mean mourning for the dead. And so he says, as a church, instead of celebrating a sinful lifestyle, instead of saying that grace will just cover everything, he, he says, think about what this is doing to your church and your reputation by allowing this sinful lifestyle to, to permeate itself among your people there. He says, you ought, you ought rather to mourn and, and uh, remove this person from among you. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a huge consideration he's trying to get them to understand here when he's talking about this. You have to consider the church. If you picture the church being covered by an umbrella, and Scripture says if there's one individual uh, member of the church that's hurting and suffering, we all suffer. So if one individual member from the church is living in sin openly, the whole church suffers under this. And so we have to consider the church that we're not allowing the church to be permeated with this kind of sin is what he's saying, right? You, he goes, first of all, you should be mourning. You should remove somebody like this from your church, period, because the influence that they have with, from within is a huge deal. They're going to start destroying the church, even when you're considering something like the outside, like even here he's mentioning the pagans don't even do this or they don't even allow it. And, and for, for the outside world to look at the church and say, yeah, you know what, I know that, that, that there's individuals that are living this type of lifestyle and the church is okay with it, so the church is no different than what I am. So why in the world would I ever want to accept Christ and be following rules that the church has? Yeah, from an outsider, that's what, what the picture is. A church is rules that you follow, that you live by. It's not even that you're living in freedom that Christ gives you. It's just church is a, a, a place of rules. And if that place where, where they're deeming, okay, well, the rules that they have in place may be so strict that it's hard to live by, and yet they're living the same lifestyle as we are, why would we ever want to subject ourselves to something like this? So he's saying, like, you're, you're, you're arrogant about this kind of thing. In a way, they're saying, you know, have you heard this term? Oh, believers are so narrow-minded. They're, like, they don't, they, they, like, they need to expand their view. They need to be open-minded to these things and, and be relevant to the culture around you. And that's kind of what these guys were doing. Like, well, around us, this type of stuff mm -hmm. is prevalent. There's sexual immorality everywhere. So in a sense, they're kind of being arrogant about the fact that, hey, look, we're so open-minded that we allow this even in the church. And Paul is saying, man, remove this person from you. This is horrible, right? Not even the pagans would allow it, even though there's all kinds of sexual immorality going on. But this type, what he's doing here, is not even allowed among the pagans. He's saying, get that person away from your church. Yeah. Don't allow them to be there anymore. So I think there's a huge consideration, even for the, for the church today, to look at something uh, like this, if there is a situation like it in the church, that the, that the church deals with it and not allows it to go on. Because from an outsider looking in, they're saying, what's the difference? You are set apart for what? Mm. Right? So I think there's a, the huge implications there. We need to really consider protecting even God's name in the church while we're dealing with stuff like this, that we're not, we're not kind of sweeping it under, under the rug and saying, eh, it's not such a big deal because the culture around us, after all, allows it. Mm -hmm. right, so there's, I think there's much, much for us to consider when we're looking at even these first few verses here. Yeah. One, one thought that may come to your mind when you're thinking about how to confront sin or, or when you confront sin in church discipline in the church 
um, I, I think one of the, the, the traps maybe or the, the things that keeps many churches from dealing with sin is they, they do an internal look which is good and they say, well, well, didn't Jesus say that he that is without sin should cast the first stone? And, and, and so they'll say, well, I, I deal with sin as well. So I can't deal with anybody else's sin. Uh, what Paul is, is he's specifically, um, he's differentiating a little, a, a little bit here about different, different degrees of sin, maybe if you can say it like that. Um, he's talking about open sin. He's talking about public sin. We, we know that there's probably people that attend church here regularly that may be living in sin that nobody knows about. Maybe, maybe practicing a sinful lifestyle that nobody knows about. Well, one of the things we know for sure is that God will judge them one day. But when it comes to somebody that's flaunting sin publicly and openly, um, we have a biblical mandate here. And I think that's where we can maybe understand there's a difference because there's also a reputation to protect as a church. And so though we... Though you might say, well, we ought not to ever deal with anybody's sin because we're all sinners. At the same time, uh, we also recognize that the church is the body of Christ and that there's an unbelieving world watching the church and there's a reputation to protect. And so when people are arrogantly, like he's saying here, living in sin, it needs to be dealt with um, in, in the same way. And, and I think sometimes, and I, I remember somebody once said this, if the, the penalty for sin or the, the dealing with sin needs to be as public as the sin. And, and you know, whether you agree or disagree with that, I, I think what it kind of means is that, that when you're dealing with sin, you deal with it in the way it affects everybody within the church. And, and so that's kind of why Paul says here, um, remove this person from among you. He's, he's being a problem to the church and its reputation. And actually, he already says, I already made a judgment. You know, I, I was there, um, and I'm not wasn't there physically, but as a spiritual father, he's saying, here, I, I, I'm not there presently, but I'm present there in spirit, and I've already made my judgment. And he says, when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, Deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so when you, you think about that thought there, delivering someone to Satan, maybe that sounds, sounds kind of odd coming from a man like Paul. And so what did he mean by delivering a man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? And, and the thought that comes to my mind is that when you, that, that, that the church like Pete was saying here earlier, has an umbrella over it, divinely by the Spirit of God. And there's a certain level of protection that, that I believe the Spirit of God has over the church body and doesn't allow the enemy to get to the, the individual church um, members because they're protected under the Spirit of God under, the, under this umbrella of the Lord. When you... When you excommunicate someone, when you, when you do what Paul is saying here, delivering them to Satan, you're not, you're not condemning them to hell. That's not actually what he's saying here. You're not removing salvation or anything. That's, I mean, that's all, that's God's part. We don't have anything to do with that. Salvation is dependent on the Lord. What we do, though, is we remove this person from this protective umbrella of the church, and they, this person now becomes um, almost like a lone wolf, a separate person, an independent. And, and now has, has um, the potential to have the enemy come and attack him individually uh, to a much greater level. And w one of the places you see that in Scripture is uh, uh, with Job. Um, remember, remember what happens in Job's life? how Satan said, well, I can't even attack him because you're going to protect him. Well, God demonstrated there that, that he could remove that protection from Job as well so that 
the enemy could attack him. And I, I almost sense it's a similar kind of idea here where you're, you're removing the protection of the church from this individual who has publicly chosen to live a lifestyle of sin and, and is an affront to the church of God. And now um, they are now exposed so that the enemy can now distract them and bring them to a place of repentance so that they will cry out to God and, and receive salvation. That they will, they will repent and turn from their wicked ways. That, that they'll get to a point in their life where, where they despair and they say, you know what, I, I, I don't want this anymore. I, I don't want to choose a sinful lifestyle. I don't want to live for the enemy anymore. I, I rather want to live for the Lord and be back under the church um, of Jesus Christ. And, and, he, and he says this is an effective way to restore people. And I remember years ago in this church here, we had a, a young man that, we, that, that was a member of the church here and, and we needed to, as a church leadership, we needed to respond to a lifestyle of sin in his life. And, and we confronted him and we um, numerous times asked him to repent of his sin. And he refused to do that. And so we, we took the really painful step of excommunicating him. And, and years later, you know, he, he walked away from the Lord for a while. But this very scenario took place in his life. Um, the enemy now had free reign to bring destruction to his flesh. And, and he repented. He repented 100%. And, and, and turned to the Lord and and was redeemed, he was born again, and acknowledged where he had gone wrong. And to this day, he is serving the Lord fully and wholeheartedly. So church discipline like this can work. The, the, the sad thing is, though, that's, there's, that's one success story. We've had to do this in other moments as well. And sometimes somebody's pride gets in the way, and they're like, well, if they don't want me, I'll just go elsewhere. And to the shame of the evangelical church, these kinds of people attach themselves to another church family who doesn't do due diligence in finding out what kind of a person this is. And before you know, they're wrecking havoc within another church family. And, and so people don't always repent. People don't always respond in this way. But God gives that opportunity for people to do that. Yeah, I think I like some of the stuff you're saying. I think the the intent on the church's behalf needs to be every single time with the thought of restoration. That if there is sin that needs to be dealt with, that it's done in such a way that it's it's intended for restoration and not not destruction. If you're looking at uh, the life of Job, he was a a servant of God. He was a a, a really righteous man, and the enemy wanted to try to wreak havoc on his life. And there, there God says. In Job 2, verse 6, he says, The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So here was a man who was serving God and for the glory of God was being tested, not because of what he had done, but to glorify God. And then it's a very different situation here. He says, Deliver this man to Satan so that his body may be destroyed, but his soul may be saved. So there's, there's two very different scenarios. Someone who's living in, in horrible sin, being set apart and allowed access by the enemy, and it's for the destruction of the flesh so that his soul may be saved. Mm. So there's very, two very different scenarios, yet they have the same thing in common, that they were allowed access to them. And, and I agree with having been part of something as horrible as an excommunication. It is probably the worst thing that I've been a part of. It, it is not a fun thing to do. And, and it's, uh, there's all kinds of emotions and stuff going on. And, and you're always praying and hoping that this individual will repent and come back because... That is the intent of it. And sometimes it does work and sometimes it doesn't, but, but we have a recipe in Scripture on how to deal with it. And, and it's not our church or our reputation at stake. It's God and His reputation. So for us to not deal, like Paul is saying here, like this has to be dealt with because it's not even their name that's at stake. It's the, the, the name of God. It's His church. They're His people. And if they allow all the stuff that God is against, then what happens to the whole church? Yeah. Right? So it's a very, very, uh, very important to not turn, turn a blind eye to somebody openly living in sin and then following Paul's recipe here of delivering them, 
even though it's one of the most incredibly hardest things to do, mm -hmm. it's something that is necessary when it comes to it. Yeah, so he goes on there, he says, he says, your boasting's not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? So he says, cleanse out that old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil. Malice is like hatred and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In, in the Old Testament in particular, even, even later on, you'll see um, the, the term leaven is often used to describe sin. Um, it's it's, it's a, almost used interchangeably in Scripture. And so he says here that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And one of the unfortunate things today is that, that in our grace-based age, um, the, this doctrine of excommunication has largely been forgotten. And many, many churches today are not practicing it. And and I, I think that they need to go back to the doctrines of the Word of God and see that, you know, there's a very real need to do this. And I, I, I don't think, I'm not here saying that we do everything perfect because I think there's moments where we could practice this to a greater degree as well. Um, and, and I just think if we were, as a church, if we were to consider the seriousness of our walk with the Lord instead of treating everything casually and and um, abusing grace. I, I think in many ways we, we abuse the, the term grace, the, the understanding of grace, and make it to mean something that it never has meant, especially as you try to counter it with the truth of this scripture passage here, where he says there that a little leaven is just a little bit um, that can destroy the whole lump. And it's the same idea that if you have a bad apple, it can destroy the whole bushel of apples. So we, we ought to then be careful with the people that we have in the church. We ought to recognize that Christ, our Passover lamb, has cleansed us. He's freed us. He's been sacrificed already. His blood has redeemed us. We ought not to go back to the old and, uh, and recognize that we've been set free with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yeah, he's, uh, even that idea of uh, a ro one rotten apple soon kind of corrupts that whole bushel. And kind of what Paul is saying here is that one apple is easier to remove than wait for the whole bushel to be destroyed, right? Mm. It's kind of... He, he's, he's asking them to be proactive so that they will, the rest of them will be able to stand. Yeah. Right? And, and if... If you have that one, like most of us un understand the, uh, the concept of baking bread when they're putting the little bit of yeast in, how that kind of permeates the whole batch of dough and it just rises and rises until you start cutting it up. But, but leaven does the same thing, it just keeps growing. If there's sin and it's not dealt with, uh, maybe at first it's a sin that is shameful, maybe it's something that nobody, you don't want anybody to find out about and you slowly as you continue in this, uh, you, you slowly be kind of start searing your conscience, becoming callous to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden it doesn't seem like such a big deal after all, you know, such and such has done it for years and there's no problem and they're still being successful and everything's still going well. And yet that's, that, that doesn't stop growing, it just keeps festering and growing and growing until one day when this happens or Sometimes God deals with you quite harshly in some uh, situations like we read in Scripture. And, but, but for it to be dealt with sooner rather than later is better for that individual and for everybody else around them as well. Amen. To say that we, that we want to practice grace and just, you know, maybe, just, maybe God will do a work and we'll just kind of sit back and watch and hopes that things kind of work out for themselves is... is uh, selfish on our part, not wanting to get involved when Scripture cl clearly says that we should. But we're, we're kind of neglecting the role of the church if we're not doing anything. And as hard as it is and as much as it's a job that nobody wants to do, it's something that has to happen. It has to happen rather sooner rather than later if there is no repentance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Amen.
Yeah, so in verse 9, he says there, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And then he, he, he clears it up there. He says, I don't mean the people of the world. I don't mean the people that you are at work with and that you do business with and those kinds of things. He, said, he says here, if, if that's what I meant, you'd have to go out of the world because you're constantly going to ca- encounter in the workplace, wherever, you're going to encounter sexually immoral people, you're going to encounter greedy people, you're going to encounter swindlers and idolaters. But he says, in the church, there's a difference. In the church, there's a difference. He says, I'm writing to you not to associate with the one who calls himself a brother or a sister. Um, it can go both ways. The one, the one who, who is a part of your family, your church family. He says, that kind of a person, um, if he is guilty of, of these sins that he names here, um, sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, reviling, drunkard, swindler, I mean, you know, sexual, sexual immorality, to be clear, probably covers almost all sexual sin. It, it, I mean, really what it means is living an immoral sexual relationship outside the bounds of marriage. And, and so Hebrews 13.4 says that God wants us to keep the marriage bed undefiled. And so when we allow a, a sexual immorality to become a part of our lifestyle, um, then you identify in this category here um, any type of sexual activity outside of the, the bounds of, of uh, marriage. And then he talks about greed, and I think sometimes we wouldn't even, we kind of just run over that, right, and not even think that it's a very meaningful thought, but greedy people too, people that are just pursuing financial gain um, and, and that don't even consider helping out others, but are more more concerned about um, financial riches. And, and, and then he says idolater, and here's another big one um, that I think many of us, if we find ourselves free from the other areas, like, like what, are we, what are we worshiping or placing at a higher level than God in our life? Because if we're placing certain things above God, maybe we are guilty of idolatry as well. And then he says, this reviling, this drunkard, somebody who's, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, even the term reviler, um, somebody who, who spends their, their days um, making fun of people, um, name-calling, uh, putting people down, and, uh, and slandering people. And, and then he talks about a swindler, too. Like, and this is someone that would maybe receive financial grain through deceit and trickery. And, and you know, maybe through, through um, sly sales tactics and those kinds of things, right? So there, there's so many things to consider um, in this particular scripture passage. But he, overall, he, he wants you to see that the church ought to be pure. You know, the, the church ought to be an entity where where sexual sin isn't manifested. And I, I think one of the saddest things today, I don't know if you guys notice it, but churches are closing down everywhere. You know, when I think about even um, many of the United Churches of Canada, you know, I don't know what happened there, but I, part of me wonders if, if um, a little leaven crept in and it permeated the whole lump. And eventually, it got to a point where the church had to close their doors. You know, there's, there's denominations within Canada that, that have been predicted by 2030, they will be wiped out entirely. There won't be churches left. And, and these are churches where there were thousands of churches across our land um, as little as 50, 60 years ago. And in a short space of time, they're gone. Their doors are closed. Many of these churches have become residential buildings. And, uh, and the name of Christ is not honored there anymore. And it's, it's really sad. And it just kind of reminds me that we need to take these things more seriously. Um, and to understand that, that a little leaven will leaven a whole lump here. And that uh, God has given us a mandate, like he says in the, in the remaining verses there too. 
to um, judge those inside the church. You know, not, not those outside the church, but those inside the church. You know, sometimes um, people will say, ah, oh, doesn't Scripture say you ought not to judge, so stop judging me? <laughs> right? Well, that's not what he says here. He says, those inside the church, you have a responsibility to judge them. Not those outside the church, but those in the church, you have a responsibility to do that and to purge them from among you. Yeah, I think sometimes we get this uh, kind of backwards when, when we see a lot of immoral stuff going on outside of the church where we're kind of disgusted by it and we're kind of talking about how horrible it is, which it is, but Paul is saying here, those that are outside the church, God will take care of. He's going to judge them. That's not up to us. Those that are inside the church, I have a friend at his workplace. Uh, he's, he was talking with uh, one of his co-workers, and, and then his co-worker knew that my friend was a believer, and he said, he goes, well, he, they were talking something about, about homosexuality, and then he said, well, my daughter has a wife. What do you think about that? And he said, that's up to her. She's, they're not believers. They're outside the church doesn't matter what they do. It, it, he goes, really, it has nothing to do with me. It doesn't matter what they do because they're, they're outside of the church. And he said, well, doesn't that mean she doesn't get to go to your heaven? He said, well, why? He said, do you believe in heaven? The guy goes, no. He said, so if you think that me having this faith where I believe that once we die, we go to heaven or hell, and if you think that's a fairy tale, why do you care who gets to go? And that's kind of how he was kind of justifying like it. I, I'm not judging you for, for the sin that you're in because you're not even born again, so your life is technically sin. You're, you're not, your whole lifestyle, everything you're doing is sin. So, so what you do within that, it, it's, it's your business. I have nothing to do with that. He goes, but, but my Bible and the God that I believe in says that this is wrong. This is what I'm living by. If you don't believe in that, then you also shouldn't care that you don't get to go to the heaven that I get to go to, because for you it's just make belief anyway. Yeah. Right. And that sometimes we we have that backwards where we look at somebody outside the church and we condemn them, and then when somebody inside the church is doing it, but there's grace, right? So we're we're not judging those that are inside the church, and we're judging those that are outside the church rather. So we have this backwards from what Paul is saying here: the ones that are outside the church. The ones that are not born again, the ones that are not believers, yes, it is our duty to witness to them, to bring the gospel to them. That is our duty. But what kind of lifestyle they're living, God will take care of. Mm. That has nothing to do with us, technically, other than the fact that we're telling them that there's a better way and Christ died for you. And if you accept His gift, His atonement, His washing of blood to make you clean, then, then you get to be part of that family of God. Other than that, what they do with it we have no control over. Hmm. So Paul is saying, why, why do you want to waste your time with judging outsiders? He goes, what, what, what do I have to do with that? He goes, don't we judge the ones that are inside the church? And then he says, purge this evil person from you. Yeah. <laughs> like it's kind of a really harsh term that he's using. It's not just, in the beginning he said, remove them. And now he's saying, purge them. Like this is like an aggressive statement. Like this needs to be done quickly so that it doesn't permeate the church. Yeah, amen. And, and you know, I, I just think if, if this was practiced more, you know, so, you know sometimes you, you hear of churches that are working through divisions and are working through factions in the church, and, and, and I wonder sometimes how much of that is because there's somebody that you're allowing in the church um, who's living a sinful lifestyle, and they're creating um, a following, and they're even uh, influencing, negatively impacting people around them. And I think the church to a much, the, the, ch the church would be in a much better place um, if we could continue to practice this. And so as you think about our church leadership too, um, please pray for us too as we, we don't want to, um, we, we don't want to pull a list out and try to pinpoint everybody's sins. That's not, I don't think that's our, what we're trying to do, but, but we, sh we ought to know that if there are individuals in the church who are um, flaunting their sin and are openly living in sin, 
and we become aware of it, we ought not to just sit on our hands. We, we need to uh, remove this person and deliver them unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And our ultimate goal in doing that is not to never see them again. Our ultimate goal in doing that is to, to um, seek their restoration, to not stop praying for them, and then to trust that they'll find repentance. And, and, that's, and that's what I believe Paul is saying here. If you go into the second book of, of Corinthians, you'll actually see it sounds like this man repented. It sounds like, like this discipline was effective, and, uh, and he repented. And so, so it, was, it was a good thing that they did there. And, and you know, that's often the way it is with us, right? Sometimes I think church discipline is a little bit like, like parents disciplining their children. Um, often when discipline happens, the end result can even be better than it was before. But yeah, there has to be a brokenness and a willingness and a submission to the will of the Lord. And so yeah, pray for us. Pray for the church that as a church we would, we would um, not allow uh, individuals to to permeate our building and make us something um, unclean in the sight of the Lord. So, yeah, I think that's where where that prayer is important for all of us to to pray that God will bring those to the church whom He would have served here, and also remove those that are a hindrance. Uh, I know when we first started coming to Lighthouse here, that was one of the prayers that Henry often prayed, Pastor Henry. And the first time I heard it, I was thinking, wow, you're actually praying that people will leave? And, and he said, yeah, if, if God will remove those who are going to cause grievances or offenses in the church, that's going to hinder us in any way for God to remove that person. I think that's very appropriate because we, as, as much as we are, we are all flawed, none of us is perfect, we can't live a perfect life on this side of eternity, so it's not even something that we're trying to, to say here with this, but, but to know that some are living a sinful life deliberately, willingly, and even planning for it so that they can accomplish whatever their goal is, and that's the kind of stuff that Paul's talking about, not, not somebody who has committed a sin, but somebody who is willingly and openly living it and even being arrogant about it. There needs to be a stop put to that. Yeah. Amen. You want to lead us in a closing prayer? Yep. Mm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again. We want to give you thanks even for this chapter. Lord, it can be a hard thing to, to even read and think about when, you, when we look at the the discipline aspect of church, of removing someone who's living in sin, and yet you have uh, given us mm. many scriptures to, to go by. When it comes to this, we don't have to try to make up our own way of doing it, but you have kind of given us a recipe already how this works, and, and we thank you for that, and I just pray, Lord, that you would, uh, not only leadership, but all of us here in the church, that we would be sensitive to it. If we see a brother or a sister sinning, that we would approach them if they repent, good. If not, then take another brother or sister with, and, and if they still won't, re won't repent, then come bring it to the church, uh, like you've told us uh, in your word. Father, I pray that you would make us all sensitive to this so that we would all together be able to uh, be strong and in unity, and also that we as a church, even here in Port Burwell, that we would be able to represent you well, that when people see Lighthouse Gospel Church or hear about it, that it wouldn't be about the individuals here, but that, would, that it would be that you are moving in our midst, that you would get glorified, that you would get all the honor for it. So we thank you for that, and even as we go on the rest of the evening and we pray, Father, I just pray that you would bless our, our time together and that you would hear our prayers that we have. So we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.